Hey guys, um, just wanted to log on and explain to you some background notes on anti-transcendentalism um, and the Scarlet Letter. So this is going to be a PowerPoint on here for you to look at later if you need it. Um, as you can see, it's without Moby Dick because we're not doing that this time around. So we have completely skipped a unit um, because we just aren't going to have time. And I really think it's important that you get through the Scarlet Letter. So I skipped over anti-transcendentalism altogether, which stinks for me because it's one of my favorite units. But Scarlet Letter is important. All right, so anti-transcendentalism. Let's get to Google Slides. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -mm -mm that. We'll just do it from here. Okay. All right, so the key ideas and philosophies... Um, or as I've been calling them, the elements or characteristics of anti-transcendentalism are the belief in the potential destructiveness of the human spirit, which is a little bit different than um, our romantics and the transcendentalists who really believe that everybody has like this good in them and um, they don't, all people don't have like an inherent evilness. So, um, the anti-transcendentalists are different because they think much like the Puritans, right? That we all have this like sin in us. We all have this potential evil in us. Um, and that's very similar to the Puritans. And we also kind of found that in, um, if you read Lord of the Flies in 10th grade, it's also kind of the same concept that everybody has like this evil inside of them. They also have a belief in individual truths, but no universal truths. And the truths of existence are deceitful and disturbing. So instead of there being like this um, overarching, these overarching themes of life, like um, the circle of life that's in, um, that we've learned about in Thanatops and Romanticism, and that, you know, that, let's see, um, nature connects us as one, and that if you go into nature that you will find yourself all of these things. There is none of this in anti-transcendentalism. Um, and what I mean by the truths of existence are deceitful and disturbing is it's back to that Puritan idea that um, we are all evil, nature's evil, and... Um, everything that we know is like a lie or there's some lie within it because lies come with the evilness of humans. Um, human nature is inherently sinful. So back to that idea of original sin and evil is an active force in the universe. And it also focuses on the man's uncertainty and limitations in the universe. So there's a big focus on, obviously, that we're all just, we all kind of have this evil nature about us. Um, that we, because of this evilness, have limitations. Like, we we are not godlike. We, you know, we as individuals are destructive. All of these kind of things. So very different from romanticism and um, transcendentalism. Now we did with Edgar Allan Poe see a lot of evilness in his works and the reason that we see that is because he borderlines between romanticism and anti-transcendentalism. So while he is definitely a romantic author a lot of people also classify him as like one of the first anti-transcendentalist author authors as well. So that's why you're kind of going to see some of the correlations there. Um, so their view of nature, this is important. Nature is no longer this um, wonderful utopia where we can find God and our relationship with God is strengthened through nature. Um, nature is vast and incomprehensible incomprehensible. It's a reflection of the struggle between good and evil. 
Um, nature also, to anti-transcendentalists, is also very evil and scary. It's like a scary place you shouldn't go to because that's where the devil might be lurking. Very similar to the Puritans, like I said. Um, nature is, they also believe that nature is the creation and possession of God and cannot be understood by human beings. So instead of the idea that the romantics and transcendentalists have that we should go into nature to um, learn about ourselves and strengthen our relationship with God and strengthen our individuality and learn about life, the anti-transcendentalists believe that, that that's futile. There's no reason to even try to do that because we cannot possibly understand nature because it is God's. And therefore, back to that Puritan idea that we can't really understand God and we can't really have a personal relationship with him. Um, so their writing style. Um, the first thing is that there's this there's always this man versus nature conflict. And this conflict brings out the evil in humanity. So anytime we see man in nature we also see some kind of evilness. And, and this evilness might be different from what you think of evil. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it will bring out like a murderous person. Like people, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to become murderers or anything. But back to that idea that man can hide in nature and therefore man can be sinful in nature. Um, there's a very raw and morbid diction, and what I mean by morbid is it's very, like, dark, scary, um, there's no hope, all hope is lost kind of words and writing. There's a focus on the protagonist's inner struggle um, because the protagonist, like all other humans, has some kind of sin that they're fighting within themselves. They're fighting in a battle between evil and good within themselves. Typical protagonists are haunted outsiders who are alienated from society. So oftentimes, especially in the Scarlet Letter, which you'll see, the person has had some battle with evil and in the eyes of society did not win that battle. And so therefore they're isolated and alienated from society as to not spread their evil. And there's tons and tons of symbolism. There's like symbolism in everything. All right, so the Scarlet Letter is what we are going to be reading together. It's going to be the last thing that we do together. Um, and I just, I really do think it's very important that we get to it because it's, it's a really big one. Um, it was written by Nathaniel Hawthorne. I hope that that name kind of rings some bells for you because Hawthorne should sound similar to Hathorne. And we had member Judge Hathorne in The Crucible. Well, Hathorne is related to Nathaniel Hawthorne. And Nathaniel Hawthorne actually changed his name completely so that he could sever ties with the evilness of um, his ancestors and what happened in the Salem Witch Trials. And this is just a um, little quote right here. When intimacy is forbidden and passion is a sin, love is the most defiant crime of all. All right, so Nathaniel Hawthorne didn't accept optimistic view of the world that people that most people of his time had. So he was he he was alive during the time of transcendentalists. Um, and he just didn't believe in all of that optimist and that there's like this good in people. He had a very pessimistic view of the world. He saw evil as a dominant force in the world. He's a descendant of Judge Hathorne, which I just said from Salem Witch Trials. And the biggest thing is that he's haunted by intolerance and cruelty of Puritan ancestors. So this is kind of where some of his pessimistic view of life and the fact that he thinks all humans have like this evil within them is because of what happened during the Puritan era with, you know, killing innocent people. Um, he, he really is trying to make up and make amends for what his ancestors did and their role in the Puritan era. Um, and so he, he can't let that go. He can't let it go that his ancestors were capable of the cruelties of the Puritan witch trials. And we're going to see that a lot. 
So our story, The Scarlet Letter, was published in 1850, and it's a story of Puritan punishment and strict morals. So you're going to be able to see a lot of connections between the Puritans, the Crucible, and all of that in Scarlet Letter, which is why I really wanted you to read it, because it's something we spent a lot of time on. So I feel like it'll be something that you can really relate to. Um, so the entire book is an allegory, which is a work of literature that in which the characters, events, and setting have symbolic meaning, and it's used to teach or explain morals and truths. So the entire book, the characters, the title, the things that happen, the setting, every single thing in the book is like a big giant, I'm a symbol, I'm a symbol, and I'll point those out as we go through. Just a reminder, since it is important, Puritanism, um, they believed in the theocracy, which is a combination of church and state. So church and state aren't separate. The church's laws and rules are also the state's laws and rules. There's a strict moral behavior code that they have to follow. The belief in devils and witches as his agents um punishment especially public punishment and the forest or nature is seen as a place of evil the devil's last refuge we also saw this in the devil and tom walker so because you know really puritanism wasn't too far away from all of the other literary movements that we've reached at this point um we see a lot of that throughout literature, even after the Puritan era, because it had a lasting effect. So we're going to see that again in the Scarlet Letter. All right. So some of the characters are, the main one is Hester Prynne, and she's a young married English woman found guilty of bearing a child by an unknown father. So she committed adultery. And therefore, she must wear a letter A, on her bodice as a punishment. And the letter A obviously symbolizes that she's an adulterer. Her daughter, Pearl Prynne, is another main character. Um, and she's high-spirited and very willful. So we're going to talk about this more as you're reading. But her daughter is like an outward symbol of her of her sins her daughter is very independent very rebellious um very unpuritan and a lot a lot of people feel like pearl is like the devil's child okay so we see her as just a normal or you should see her as just a normal really high spirited awesome child but the time period that they lived in pearl is like a little demon baby basically um, Arthur Dimsdale is the pastor of Hester's congregation and is very important to the story. Roger Chillingworth is Hester's really old husband who finally returns from overseas to America um, and takes on his name, Roger Chillingworth. That wasn't his original name, but he actually changes his name to this whenever he gets to the colony so that he isn't associated with Hester. And he decides to seek revenge on the baby's father. Governor Billingham is an actual historic figure. Um, he was the governor of Boston. Um, so he is actually like a real person. What he does isn't necessarily real, but he is a real person. And then Mistress Hibbins is actually a historic figure as well. She is the governor's sister and was executed for witchcraft in 1656. So she represents temptation in the story. Um, I also personally think that she's one of the most tolerant people in the story, um, which is kind of sad. So um, really quick, I want to talk about some of the symbolism right, while we're right here. So Roger Chillingworth is Hester's husband, and he changes his name when he gets to the colonies for a lot of different reasons. First of all, he doesn't want to be associated with the shame that now comes with Hester because she had a child out of wedlock. I mean, well, because she had a ch child with another man while she was married. Okay. Um, he also changes his name because... 
the community is a little less strict and harsh on Hester because her husband never appears, and so they actually think that he might be dead. Um, so he doesn't want her to be killed now that he's alive. So his name, Chillingworth, sh is, should kind of make you think of, like, getting chills, okay? So he's, he's kind of like a scary evil figure is what he ends up being in the story. Um, Arthur Dimsdale, I'm not going to give you too much background on him, but he is Hester's pastor, and his name has meaning too. So Dim is like a, when the lights get dim, right? They go down. They're not as bright. So his name kind of is significant too later on. Pearl is obviously um, something that women wear on jewelry. It's um, valuable. It's precious. It's white. So white's the color of innocence. Um, so Pearl's name is very symbolic because she is Hester's prized possession, basically. Okay? And Hester kind of has a well, Like Hester starts with H, just like Harlot starts with H. So that. So there you go. All right. So now you are going to start reading chapters one through three. I know that that sounds like a lot, but it really isn't. I think it ends up being like 20 something pages. It's not really a lot. Um, and then after you've read, you're going to answer some questions. Um, I'm going to do another video to give you some kind of background on some of the things that happened in the story to help you recap too. All right, guys. Hope this helps. Good luck. I hope you enjoy it.